Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I think we're going to get started. We might have some people filter in. That's great. So welcome to this afternoon's EIR workshop. I will introduce our speakers in just a moment. I just wanted to have an opportunity to welcome all of you. Some of you are familiar faces. Some of you are newer to the research park. I'm Laura Bly. I'm the associate director here. Um, and so welcome. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of our Entrepreneur in Residence program. This is much broader than just the workshops that we do. We have uh, about 10 people who are coaches and mentors for people who are in existing companies, but also for people who may just have an idea and are interested in having a sounding board. Of course, all related to science and tech-based companies. So, um, it's a simple form that you fill out on our website, researchpark.illinois.edu, to get access with either someone, either Lori or someone like Lori. So we have a whole team of people who can help. Um, we also have a bunch of other events coming up, as we always do. But one, of course, I want to give uh, a shout out to, which is fun. And you don't have to think much. You just have to bring a blanket and maybe some food, or you could buy food from the food trucks. But the outside research park concert is tomorrow night, so we hope we'll see you all. I actually just got an update. If anybody has been watching the weather, the weather is like, Ooh, but so I'm just I'm going like this. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, we do have um, we are looking at that but we hope that the weather will hold off until after we get our concert in. So anyway, I hope to see many of you there. Uh, and it's free, of course. So without further ado, um, just want to make sure that you are aware that our speakers today, our lovely women from PIXO, are two amazing business minds in our community community leaders outside of their workplace as well. And so this is a topic of about growing people and growing culture in your organization. That is something that I know they hold near and dear um, to what they do on a daily basis. So you're really hearing from two experts and leaders in their fields. And so Lori Patterson, who is the, the CEO of Pixo, a software development company in Urbana uh, for I don't know how many years, but 20 years. So. Um, and, and Erica Kramer, who we have worked with over the years and had her um, in many different settings. And you've been in Pixel how long now? Ten years. Ten years. So I knew it was quite some time. But uh, I think this shows a dedication to a company that oftentimes you don't see anymore. So kudos to you guys for creating that culture. But um, we're really excited to have them back here today and to hear what they have to say, both Lori and Erica. So I will welcome you guys up here and you can take the floor. Thank you so much. This is um, all the EIRs. And I see Alan, a colleague of mine. Raise your hand, Alan, who's also one of the EIRs here. Any other EIRs? Um, it's one of my one of my favorite things that, um, that we get to do as an EIR to come and think about what is a topic that might really be relevant to startup companies, to companies that are at different stages. Um, and I seem to be pretty often on the side of the soft skills. So, you know, as we're running a company, as we're managers of a company um, or of people, there's a lot of hard skills that we know are important. You know, we're watching the financials. We're um, trying to identify our minimum viable product. We're looking at our monetization model. All of those things and many, many others. What they have behind them, though, is the human perspective. We're people that have feelings and have moods and need to feel safe and we need to um, to be able to be vulnerable at times and know that the feedback that's important for ourselves is going to come to ourselves and that the feedback that others need is going to come to them. So at PIXO we spend quite a lot of time on the human side of things in order to be very good at the hard skills that we provide to our clients. In so doing, periodically we come across um, some book or a reference of some sort that helps us drive home the, the, what's really important to us, the values of us. And about a year and a half ago, I came across a book called Radical Candor. And the words sounded fantastic to me because that's what we really profess is being honest and giving feedback 
I read this book and it was fantastic. So I introduced it to some of the leadership. Well, it went viral. If you can go viral in a, in a company of 30, it went viral. And, and almost everybody in the company now has, has read this book. So what I want to do today is really talk about the main highlights, that, the things that really inspired us out of this book. So I pulled my colleague, Erica Kramer, who's um, a director at the company. She, as Laura said, she's been with us for 10 years. And she's been one of the spearheaders of really taking this book throughout the company, but not just having people. We, she helped put together um, a book club um, that, that met and went through each chapter of this. But she has really helped bring some of the key messages and, and techniques into the company. So I met with her and thought she, she can help me put this presentation together. And as we're meeting and putting the presentation together, it became clear that she knows this shit way better than I do. <laughs> and that this is about growing your people. And she is not one that has historically gotten up and, and spoken on, on behalf of Pixar or other things that, that she's passionate about. But it dawned on me that I needed to get out of the way. So she, um, she did tell me this story just driving over here that she was really pissed at me when I did that. <laughs> When I said, I think you should be the one to present, she said, okay, now that kind of tight. But I am exceptionally proud of her and very thrilled to announce who would be way better at bringing this topic across, my colleague and friend, Erin. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, Lori, and thank you for having us. So yesterday, as I asked one of my colleagues to please listen to this, you know, I want to do a test run and want to make sure that I get my points across. Ten minutes into the presentation, she stands up and she runs to the bathroom and vomits. So if I haven't improved since yesterday, the bathrooms are right around the corner. So as Lori mentioned, what we want to talk about today is this book that made a huge impact on us as individuals and as Pixel as a company, um, Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Well, let me start with a story. So, we, Pixel had an intern um, five years ago who is now a full time employee and actually a leader at our company. And just recently, a few months ago, we celebrated her fifth Pixel anniversary in a staff meeting. And, and as, as I was prepping for that staff meeting the night before, I came across this email exchange between her and I from five years back. And in this email, she was telling me that her uncle had died and that she needed to go to a funeral in Chicago, which was probably going to need a day or two off. And back then, we didn't have a funeral leave. And she was asking whether that was OK. And my response to her was, I'm sorry, was he ill? And after that short, unemotional response, I went into asking all the details about the project. On project number one, you know, who's going to make sure that we're meeting this deadline? And project number two, and who's going to cover you in this, this other meeting? And so after the staff meeting, and of course, reading that email, I felt exceptionally embarrassed. And I kept thinking, who is this unemotional, careless bitch? And so the next day, I go to the staff meeting, and after her, I find her and say, hey, I don't know if you remember, but five years ago, when you told me your uncle died, and you sent me this email, and my response was blah, I am so embarrassed, I am so sorry. And her response was, oh, I remember that. I was wondering what kind of company I'm getting into. And as I was thinking about that, I wanted to ask, well, why didn't you say that? Why didn't you say something? I could have had an aha moment then. I could have learned, right? But it makes sense that she didn't say anything. She was an intern just starting, and I was a director, right? So I'm saying all that because radical candor is the topic of this um, talk. And radical candor is the combination of caring personally and challenging directly. Caring personally, well, what does that mean? Well, as Lori said, we are all humans, and we have human feelings, and we want to make sure that we bring those human feelings with us to work. And 
it's not enough that we care about the people's careers or that we care about their projects and the work that they're on, but we really want to connect with them and learn what's important for them. Why do they get out of the bed in the morning to come to work, right? You really want to understand how each person's job and work fits into their life and their life goals. And especially if you're managing and you're supervising people, Kim, the author of this book, is really suggesting that you get to know every single report, every single calling that you have at this level. So what is radical candor um, and, sorry, so the second dimension is challenge directly. And challenge directly could be hard. This is basically asking you to give direct feedback. And the reason that, that could be hard is because you might not have that relationship established with your colleague, right? So at the intersection of this is radical candor. I'd like to show you an example now, a video by Kim Scott, the author. So she just had an important meeting and she works for Google and her boss is Sheryl Sandberg. You might have heard that name. She's the author of Lenin, the book. And the meeting went, went fantastic. So the shareholders were there, the owners were there, and she has gotten a great vibe and she's feeling good, yet her boss Cheryl is asking her to come to her office because it's feedback time. Okay. After it was over, my boss uh, said, why don't you walk back to my office with me? And I said, sure, sort of expecting a little bit of a victory lap. And she started telling me about the four or five things she liked about the presentation, how impressed she was with how the business was doing. But I was getting more and more nervous as we were walking because I sort of had a feeling the other shoe was about to drop. Uh, but I had no idea what I had done wrong. So this was an uncomfortable moment. And finally she said, but, and I sort of held my breath, you said, um, a lot. And I was like, ah. Oh. No big deal, I know I do that. I, I, it didn't really seem like, who cared if I said um a lot when I had a tiger by the tail. So she said, was it because you were nervous? <sighs> nervous, not me. And then she said, would it help if Google hired a speaking coach for you so that you could learn not to do this? And I said, you know, I'm really busy. It just doesn't seem like the most important thing in the world. And she said, you know, Kim, when you do that thing with your hand, I can tell I'm not really getting through to you. I'm going to have to be more clear here. When you say, um, every third word, it makes you sound stupid. That got my attention. Now, I would have said that it wasn't very nice to say that I sounded stupid, but in fact, it was the kindest thing that she could possibly have done for me. If, if she hadn't said it just that way, I would have kept blowing her off. I wouldn't have addressed the problem, and it would have what a silly thing to let trip you up um, at a job. Um, I still do it, but not as much. It would be a total state of paralysis if I hadn't gone to that um coach that Cheryl sent me to. So how does Cheryl, it sounds like kind of a simple thing to say you need to correct something, but it very rarely happens. So what I, what I did was I tried to operationalize what my boss was so good at so that I could do it and so that I could teach the people who worked for me to do it and now teach all of you to do it. So I'm going to boil it down to sort of a very simple framework. On the vertical axis is what I call the give a damn axis. And part of the reason why Cheryl was able to say to me so bluntly, you sounded stupid, was that I knew that she cared personally about me. She had done a thousand things that showed me that. When I first moved to California from New York and I didn't know anybody, I didn't have any friends, she invited me to join her book group. When I had a family member who got very sick, she was totally clear with me that my first responsibility was to my family and I should just leave and go and deal with that. And she had me covered at work. And she did that not just for me, but for all of the people who worked for her. Um, so caring personally is going to make it much easier to do the next thing that you have to do as a good boss, which is to be willing to piss people off. Colin Powell said leadership uh, often means being willing to piss people off. 
So that is what, at the intersection of caring personally and challenging directly, uh, is radical candor. And so this is a beautiful example of what radical candor is, right? And in my story, so between those two quadrants, right, I really failed with the intern to show that I care person. So if you can be radically candid with someone, the second best thing to do is to be obnoxiously aggressive. You would think that you want to stay up in the care person quadrant, right? That looks better. You want to care. But actually, it is better to come down here and be here. Why? Because at least you give the feedback and people know where you stand. They know what you think, right? Even if you're maybe not showing that you care and you don't take the time to show that. Um, so, <coughs> The low left quadrant, if we keep going, is manipulative insincerity. That's when you stay quiet because you care more about your own feelings and how people would perceive you. So therefore, you don't challenge your colleagues directly. The next column is ruinous empathy. And ruinous empathy happens when you also stay quiet because you are so nice. You avoid conflict. It happens a lot with parents and kids. You don't want to say, you don't want to challenge them correctly because you love them so much. But at the end, you're ruining them, right? That's ruinous empathy. And again, this is a shorter video. I, she's doing this more beautifully than I am. I want to show a video of Kim again, the author, giving us an example of what ruinous empathy is. The vast majority of management mistakes happen in a quadrant that I call ruinous empathy. And so to explain what I mean by ruinous empathy, I'll tell you a sad story about probably the worst moment of my whole career. So there was this guy who was working for me, we'll call him Bob, and Bob was charming. He had this sort of quirky sense of humor. He, we, we were doing one of those off-sites and there was some stupid get-to-know-you exercise and he made us all stop doing it and he, he went around the room and he said, what candy did your parents use to potty train you? Oddly, we all remember. Um, and for the rest of the year, every time there was a tense moment in a meeting, uh, Bob would whip out the right piece of candy for the right person and <laughs> break the tension totally. So I don't know, maybe I have a weird sense of humor, but I found this endearing and I really liked Bob. Um, so I really wanted to be nice to Bob. The problem was that Bob was absolutely terrible at his job. Uh, and he was sort of, he kind of knew it, and he would come to me and he would say, hey, I'm worried, and I would sort of try to reassure him and buck him up. And after about 10 months of this, it became clear to me that if I didn't address the situation with Bob, I was, I was, I was gonna lose two or three of my very best people. So, having tried to be nice to Bob the last 10 months, having never criticized him because I was trying to be nice, I was now sitting in front of Bob firing him. Not so nice after all. And when I told him, Bob pushed his chair back and he looked at me and he said, why didn't you tell me? And as that question was sort of rolling around like a bowling ball in my head, he said, why didn't anyone tell me? I thought you all liked me. So I want to show basically these four quadrants with another example from Pixel. So we had another staff meeting and we were celebrating something, I can't remember what, but we had food. And we had fruit and we had strawberries. And the whole day goes by and we're meeting with Lori actually at 4 p.m. up in her office and her office is a bathroom. So right before the meeting she comes out of the bathroom and she says, what is this? And she's pointing at her teeth and there are two or three black strawberry seeds in her teeth. And she says, I had three client meetings today, and I've seen all of you. How come no one told me that my teeth is full of strawberry seeds, right? So someone, based on this principle, could have just whispered to her and said, hey, there's something in your teeth. Check it out, right? That's radical candor. The second best thing to do is, even in a meeting, someone could have just said, hey, you look fine. What is that, right? That might have not been so polite or nice, but still, she could have addressed it, right? She doesn't go all day long without or with strawberries, strawberry seeds in her teeth. 
But somehow we all stayed in this left quadrant of stay, staying, um, stay, staying silent. So, if you're like me, well, English is not my first language, so let me start with that. But even if English is your first language, these obnoxious, aggressive, and all these words could just be a little too much. And so I was trying to look for an image that's easier. And I found this. This is also like him, so I'm not going to take credit for it. But this is easier, right? Easier words, kind and clear, so much easier to digest than brunous empathy. <laughs> and this really demonstrates that depending on where you're at, so I personally tend to be in this quadrant. I have no problem saying what's on my mind and give my colleagues direct feedback, but I need to learn how to be more kind and push myself up over there to radical candor, right? You might be over to, you're very nice, but you're maybe avoiding conflict and you're like, oh, I don't want to give that feedback, or maybe I'm going to give it to him when it's review, review time, right? And so you need to move over to the radical candor and be more clear. So how do you start? How do you build a culture of radical candor? Well, it can start with you, right? You can first ask people to criticize you. And why is that the best way? Because that way you show that you really care, right? You actually care what the others have to tell you. You also show that you know that many times you are wrong and you want to be challenged. Um, and if you're a manager or supervisor, you really want to put yourself in the shoes of what does that feel like? It's yucky, right? When you're like, she didn't feel good. She was nervous when Cheryl said, yeah, come, come to my office, right? When she just had an amazing meeting. So you want to put yourself in that shoes and really feel that because the next time hopefully you need to give it, you'll be better at it. Well, you also need to listen with the intent to understand and not to respond. So what does that mean? Well, um, this is not the time to debate the feedback that you're getting or start correcting the stories that your person is finally sitting down and giving that feedback, right? But it's time to really open your ears and understand and take that in. So try saying things like, what I hear you say is, in that meeting yesterday, I interrupted her too many times. At minute five, she completely shut down, and therefore she, we actually don't know what her opinion is. Is that what you're saying? So ask questions back and try to really demonstrate that you understand. Um, and you need to reward criticism to be able to get more of it. So when this happened with Lori, right, she didn't just take that as a who no one told me, but for weeks after, even now she does it, she says, hey, I have a plan meeting. Is there anything we're doing? Do you see anything, right? So she's still, still practicing because to show everybody that she really cares and she's inviting that feedback. I want to give one more story. Okay, about yeah. it. So this morning was really interesting. Uh, we, had a, our, we had a staff meeting every week and both of us came out of that meeting and said, there was a lot of radical candor in the staff meeting. In the staff meeting this morning, um, we do what's called aha moments. And aha moments are when, when someone or some of us have learned something really pertinent. We will come in front of the staff and sometimes we'll do a little skit or we'll replay it. And we try to bring that real feeling of aha to everybody. So this morning one of the ahas was one that I was involved in. And, um, and part of it was me screwing up. It, it, it was a, a real, you know, some real good stuff and some real hard stuff. And one of our new employees, um, who's, who came from a pretty rough environment where, work environment, where the feedback that she would get was not, you know, they would want, say that they wanted her to be a particular way and she would act that way and that really wasn't how they wanted her to be. It was a very, you know, passive aggressive environment. So she's very slow to trust that what we say is what we mean. Well, she was in this conflict, in this aha, um, and while it was going on, she spoke up and said to me, I disagree. Even if, I had just said, you know, if we had done this, then, she said, I disagree. Even if we had done that, it still wouldn't have been the right way to do it. Well, later that evening, I called her. Unfortunately, I didn't get her on the phone, but I left her a message and said, thank you. I 
you, you hear us say all the time that we want direct feedback. That was perfect. We needed that so badly. So I hadn't really heard, I didn't know if that resonated with her, but in, this morning, we're doing this aha, and it was about that moment, she wasn't presenting the aha. And we're about to move on to the next topic, and she raises her hand and says, actually, I want to say something. And she said, when she got that voicemail message, it said to her, what I'm being told is real. And Lori was vulnerable enough and clear enough that I know now to do that, and I will continue to do that. So it was such an aha, on top of the aha, of, of when we talk about rewarding criticism, I, I immediately recognized that she did what I want her to do all of the time, and so I wanted to give her feedback about that right away. And that was a real reward that will stay with her forever now. Probably still on, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so that is rewarding criticism. Another way of doing that is you can come up with a solution. So that example that I mentioned, someone interrupting too many times in the meeting and maybe shutting one of their colleagues down, um, you could say, hey, if I do this next time, just kick me under the table. Or go ahead and say, hey, Erica, you're doing it again. And that allows the person, not just that you took the feedback and you're taking it to heart, but you're coming up with a solutions together and you're letting her know that it's okay to tell you in the moment next time and not wait another year when it's feedback time, right? So another way to, for you all to start radical candor in your organizations is to make it not just safe but natural to criticize you. So the book mentions a great example, they call it the orange box, and there is this company and the CEO asked all his employees to put any kind of critique they want throughout the month in this orange box. And this orange box, box is very accessible, um, an accessible place at the company. And once a month when it was staff meeting, he would go and take the, critis, the critics out of the box and he would read it out loud and respond to it. Not debate it, not just respond to it. And it really um, opens up like so it, it provides openness and helps with vulnerability. It's something that we implemented at Pixel as well. We call it the radical candor box after the book. But it's something that Lori does in staff meetings. Same thing, we ask anyone at the company that if they have a question or they heard a rumor, they're just like, hey, I've been hearing that. Is that true, not true, what's happening? Or they just have a question, put it in that box. And twice a month, when it's um, staff meeting time, she would sit there and take those out one by one and answer them, or answer with the help of um, some of the other colleagues. But it really impacted us. It sees how open we are. Even sometimes those questions are, I can guarantee you, very hard. And you know, I don't want to be in her shoes answering those. But it really shows that she has nothing to hide. We're all vulnerable with each other, right? Um, so. Where do you stand today? Which quadrant are you in? You can start by having that conversation next time you meet with your manager or you're talking with any of your colleagues. And obviously, we love this book, and so we're recommending that you read the Radical Candor book. But if you're like me and you have two young kids and eight books in your nightstand, and a year <laughs> later you still haven't touched most of it, then I just recommend that you go to the website radicalcandor.com and she has amazing videos that she uploaded, they have role play, um, she has a podcast, and she has really cool tips. Um, one I definitely want to share because many times we read an amazing book like this one and we don't remember any of it after we read it, right? All we remember is that that was amazing, but if someone asks what was it about, it's like, oh, I don't know. Um, so what she's recommending is that this book has really great imagery. So print out some of those and put it in the conference rooms or in the meeting rooms that you have one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe it's your office, right? Because that way it stays front and center and you always remember what that was. Um, so briefly I'm going to talk about this, but this is another principle in the book. Um, she has many good chapters. These radical candor and this, these are not the only two that she's talking about. She's talking about. 
But she has another great um, principle, which is distinctions between rock stars and superstars. And, oh, what happened? I pressed the wrong button. Oh, yeah. oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, what does she mean by rock stars and superstars? Well, rock stars love their work. They're solid. They're rock solid. They are not motivated by the next promotion. They're not trying to climb that corporate ladder, right? It's the idea of not all artists want to own a gallery, right? Superstars, on the other hand, they are always looking for that next, next opportunity. They want to grow. They want to go fast. They're always like two steps ahead of you. So, and in our interviewing, and even in your organization, it's easier because they're just constantly asking. They're constantly in your face, right? How do I, well, what's my next title? How do I get promoted, right? But it's just as important to acknowledge and listen to the rock stars as you are to the superstars, sometimes even more important. And what the key idea is that King is talking about in this book is to understand what growth trajectory they are on. Because where they are now and where they're headed. Because you don't want to label anyone. So don't say he's a superstar. Because these things change. It could be that someone's a superstar for two years and then something happens and now they're a rock star, right? Or vice versa. I consider myself, uh, or I had been a superstar when I started at Pixel and for many years. And, and then I have two kids and I'm happy to be alive at the end of the day and <laughs> definitely a rock star over there, not a superstar, right? Um, so, but it helps the conversation when you meet with your manager or your colleagues and you want to identify how do we talk about them? How do we grow them? How do we, to, how do we listen, right? This, these, um, the names just help you have that conversation. Because I'm sure here in the research park with many of the startups, sometimes it's hard because you maybe don't even have a title yet, or you have a title, but it takes years to even have a job description, right? And you have scalability problems. And there's that problem of um, making sure that what you hear, you can actually implement. So I have a story. Um, one of our graphic designers, very talented graphic designers, we had a review with him. We have annual performances. And he, we asked him, well, where do you see yourself going? Where do you want to be next year? And he clearly stated that he wants to be a creative director. And that's all great, but we did not have an open position for a creative director, nor did we think that Pixel needs a creative director, right? So these conversations could be really hard, um, because what we wanted to say is thank you for the feedback, and we're going to take that into consideration, and like, please go back and do that amazing work that you do. Um, six months goes by, and it's review time again, and we ask the question again, well, where do you see yourself going? And the answer is the same. I want to be a creative director. And luckily, we had a consultant come from California, and she talked about employee retention and talked about this phenomenon that small organizations have with making sure aligning employees with their goals and what they want to do in life with what can the company do at that moment in time. So aligning that could be really hard, right? And she suggested that we really start focusing and listening and not focus on the answer, creative director, but really try to understand what does that mean. And with her help, we came to the conclusion and understood this graphic designer. And what he really wanted is, well, he's been with Pixel for two years, so he kind of wanted the title change at that point. He wanted more recognition. He wanted more challenging projects. And he wanted to be part of kind of the vision of the graphic design department, right? So at a small company, most of that can be achieved without a promotion. Promotion cannot be the answer all the time, right? Because for example, the more challenging part, right? You wanted more challenging projects. Well, that could be achieved with just talking to the sales department, making sure there's open dialogue between those two, and that they understand what kind of project is he interested in? What skill set what he wants to grow? So when they get prospective clients, they can say, oh, that sounds great. That's exactly what he was talking about. Okay, let's make sure we have this one. 
So, or when it's about vision talks, well, the next time Lori and some of the leadership for UX and design is happening, we want to make sure he's part of that meeting, right? So some of these are easily achieved at a small organization without constantly promoting. Um, and radical candor can really be everywhere. It can be when you hire, when you fire, it can be when you give feedback with, to your close colleagues, um, it can be at formal performance and, uh, review time, and you just want to make sure, it, it takes a lot of time and effort, it's not easy, it's not, I'm not standing here as an expert telling you, I want to say that we're still practicing, I fail every single day at this, but I have the principle in my head, and I'm trying to aim for it, I'm trying to really understand. And it really helps that now at the leadership level, because we all read this book, and many of the employees have as well, we have this common language. We all know what it means, okay, that was really radically candid, that was perfect. Or, ooh, that was kind of ruinous empathy, you want to be over there, like, look at this. We're talking about firing her, and you as his direct manager haven't given her any kind of feedback for 10 months now, right? So it really helps us, it also helped us to understand each other of where we're at in this moment. Lori's the only one who's ready to hand it, just want to put it out there. Everyone else is over in the other province. And it helped us know where we are today and where we're trying to go, right? So these are some of the other books that we're recommending. Patrick Lancioni has these beautiful, amazing books, Get Me Naked and the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Start with the Why by Simon. Sign it, I highly recommend. And there's this last one, this one is not a book, so five types of thinkers of your team. This is an exercise that I'm happy to send over. It's a PDF, it takes about 20 minutes. Um, but we did this as a team again. And this puts, after answering I don't know how many questions, it kind of puts you in the a category. And when we did this, as again, as a leadership team, we realized that Ooh, we have three people in this category, two over here, and look at this, we have none in these other two. So, no wonder that we kind of have problems over here in the XYZ area, because look at our leadership and how we're put together. We just don't have the people that have these strengths, right? So, anyhow, I hardly, um, hardly, I highly recommend um, these resources, and if there's any that you have, we absolutely welcome it. So, thank you. We've got 10, 10 or so minutes. Um, if anyone has questions, we can pass the mic around. <coughs> it is with the harder ones. Pretend it's the radical candor box. <laughs> Have you had any team members that, uh, I mean, it sounds like you've developed a culture, but could you talk about any team members that were maybe slow to adopt or some challenge, some challenge uh, maybe that you felt uh, in bringing this into the culture of the company? Uh, well, I just want many people who read only let's see a few chapters of Radical Candor, um, it's easy to think, well, okay, I'm going to be, or you hear like, okay, I'm going to be Radical Candor with you, and boom, you're an asshole, that was not, that's not Radical Candor, right? And you want to correct that right away. It's also not, like, some people say, okay, I, this is what we're reading, I really need to get to know my colleagues. So, you socialize all week long after five left and right. That's also not bad, okay, that's not what it's about, right? So, it's really us constantly going, or we have examples where we thought we were radically candid in giving feedback. And we had an employee where... So the book is suggesting, for example, that you give amazing um, praise, but then you say something that's not working well, right? And then so Lori and a few others tried it, and when something is amazing, you, you send an email or you say it in person, and then you keep something that they could improve. Well, it turns out that Lori can speak to this, forget that, that's not working. They only focus, especially if it's coming from Lori, they only focus on the little tiny thing that Lori's saying it did not work. They completely ignore all the amazing things that she's praising them about. So there are definitely hit and miss um, that we're still trying to... In terms of, of uh, individuals not adopting it, 
Um, I think every, everybody understands and wants a place, and that Pixel for sure, wants a place where they can feel um, safe, where they feel like, like if someone has something that they're concerned about, they're going to hear it. Now, how comfortable different people are, um, we're all at very, very different levels, but as Erica um, said, we constantly talk about how much more we have to grow in that respect. We do not, you know, this, this concept, other concepts that we have at Pixel on the, on the relationship and the culture side are not things that you get perfect. They're not things that once you learn them, then you know them. They're things that you have to have new reading material, new exercises, new aha moments all the time to remember and to bring those things forward. Alan. Yeah, I think you just addressed my question. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. More questions or other suggestions? Anything that you you've been thinking with your teams or you've seen that's in this category? I guess my question is, deals with uh, how much do you individualize uh, this approach with different personalities? So some people are very open to uh, guidance, and other people are very creative, uh, but. But also, kind of want to—I don't know—they're—they're they're not quite as open to criticism and candor. How do you deal with those personalities? That's a, a really good question. Um, for sure, with communication, there's different—you know—speeds uh, at which you may say your words. There's um, how quickly you get to the bottom line. There's you know care. You know, on the you know, caring deeply, um, knowing who you're talking to, but we do not distinguish amongst ourselves. We can't give her radical, radical and, you know, be candid with her because she can't take it so well. We do not. Nobody is off the hook. Um, so that is all very, very even. But but as you care about someone, like if they have just lost their pet. It's probably not the best day, even if you had been planning on giving them some direct feedback. Let's let let's let that settle in a little bit, and then let's go for a walk, you know, next week, and we can give that feedback. Those are great questions. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. You did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for having me.